Okay. What we want to do today is to look at digital simulation. Okay. Uh, simulation of digital circuits. Now, uh, central to that uh, is a very nice idea uh, that is uh, involved in simulating these uh, integrated circuits. The, before I get into the actual theory of that and so on, which we will do, the question that you should ask yourself is what is the biggest challenge for digital simulation? Okay. Now, the simulation is easy. 0, 1, there are logic equations. So, if you know what is the input, calculating the output, not a big deal for logic simulation. Okay. The bigger challenge is actually the complexity. <coughs> what it means is that calculating everything to the nth degree of so many circuits which are typically expected to be there in an integrated circuit, that is the real complexity. Okay. The other part is that suppose we had the computing power to simulate everything in detail, that output will be useless to us because it will have so much detail that we will not be able to make sense out of it. So the point is that in that case, if we are not going to do a fully accurate simulation at an analog level, then what kind of detail is expendable and what kind of detail is essential? Okay, because those are the considerations which then go into logic simulation. So, one thing is obvious that a 0 should remain a 0, a 1 should remain a 1 and if it is at an indeterminate level, then that should be pointed out. That means you do not have two valued logic, you actually have three valued or four valued logic like you have in Verilog for example. So, just a binary bit is not very good for simulation because it forces its output is constrained to be either 0 or 1 whereas in real life you may have some design flaw and if you cannot catch that flow, the flaw then why are you doing the simulation at all? If the simulation always tells you that you are right then you might as well not run it. Okay? So therefore one of the things is that the correctness of logic simulation is important and then the appropriate choices of the output. Now, what is expendable? The exact waveform is expendable. For example, suppose the output reaches 4.2 volts and then goes on to 4.6 and then dips down to 4.3 and goes up, it does not matter. A 1 is a 1, right? In fact, that is what the previous lecture concentrated on, how to make circuits so that a 0 is a 0 and a 1 is a 1 and the exact analog voltage within that range becomes immaterial. Okay. So, you know that circuits are designed to be like that if you use logic gates. So, therefore, what is expendable is this analog detail. In fact, if this detail is there, it is distracting. When you look at a waveform and it has all sorts of wiggles and so on, there is a lot of uh, detail in this waveform of which as digital designers we have no use. Okay. So, that is one thing which is not required. Is all analog expendable? Is it okay to have square waves for everything? The answer is no, not quite square waves. The rise time is important for digital considerations, the fall time is important, the delays are important. Okay? So therefore, we must not think that logic simulation is only a simulation of, is Boolean simulation, where only whether if the inputs are zeros and ones, what outputs will be there in terms of zeros and ones. That is not the only thing you do need some sort of analog simulation which estimates the time taken to go from a 0 to 1 etc etc accurately. So, the actual transition time is important. On the other hand, the exact shape of that transition is not important. Okay? So, when I did the analysis of the CMOS logic gates yesterday, we saw for example that initially it is linear and then it becomes logarithmic uh, etc etc. All those details are not important. Okay, it is important to understand where most of the rise time, fall time is going, etc. how you should bias if you are designing single logic gates. But as a user of those gates, designing designers of digital systems, the exact trajectory taken in going from 0 to 1 is not important as long as the rise time, fall time, delay times, etc. are accurate. Okay? So that sets up our parameters of what kind of detail is expendable and what kind of detail is desirable. Okay? And the more we reduce the detail, the more efficient our simulation will be because we will not do the things whose output we do not desire. 
Okay. The other thing is that if you have a digital gate and if its inputs are not changing, then, in the, then there is no need to recompute the output. Right? If the inputs have been known earlier and the inputs are not changed, then there is no point in recomputing the output. You can assume that the output continue to be at a level where they are. Okay? So we must make use of this and this is done in a style which is called event driven style. Okay? In event driven, if no event occurs, then no new simulations are performed. That means if there is no switching from 0 to 1 and so on, no further simulations need to be performed. However, if there is an event, you pull out the sub circuit which is affected by this event. Rest of the circuit need not be re-simulated because their inputs have not changed. Okay? So you pull out a sub circuit from this more complicated circuit which will be affected by the events which have occurred and then ripple through their outputs to see what events will be caused at the output as a result of these events at the input and then these will affect other circuits and those will affect other circuits and so on. So the style of, uh, of simulation is very different from circuit simulation which we will be doing and but I am sure you are familiar with, you, most of you do p-spice and so on. p-spice you simulate for all time whether something ha is happening or not and you produce a plot of the output as a function of time continuously. Whereas here, recomputation is done only when an event occurs. Okay? So you have conquered complexity by two devices here. One, you never handle the full circuit. You pull out a sub-circuit which is affected by these events. So as a result, at a given time, you are not handling the entire complexity of the large circuit that you are simulating. So that is in the complexity phase, the number complexity. And in time complexity, you are not looking at your circuit all the time. You are looking at the circuit only when you need to. Right? The combination of these two leads to efficient digital simulation. And most digital or logic simulators or timing simulators make use of this. The simulator that we are going to use today is called IRSIM. It was developed earlier at uh, Stanford University. Uh, it has been called by different names. It was initially simply called SIM. Okay? However, what they did was that they made it interactive and made it re-simulatable. Okay? I will tell you about re-simulation. What they did was something that we all wish we had the capability of and namely they can roll the clock backwards. Okay? After all it is a simulation. So you can roll the clock backwards. So if sup suppose some bug occurs, it is not necessary that this bug has occurred because of something which happened now. The, that bug might be the result of something which happened much earlier. So you need to have the capability of a trace back and therefore you need to have the capability once something has happened to go back. Now earlier the only thing was that if a bug occurs then you re-simulate and stop it short of this and see if everything is okay up to this point and then stop it further and so on. Whereas here they made a program which is re-simulatable in backward direction that is you can go backwards in time. Okay? So that became from SIM, RSIM. Okay? And that was also a command line interface. They made it interactive and that is called IRSIM. That is the program that we are going to look at. It is a public domain program. It is a very good program. Okay? Also one advantage of using public domain programs for this sort of a thing is that source code is available and many additions have been written for this program by our own students. Okay? To the extent that some of the junior students who had used these things went to some other place and ran IRC when they came back to us and saying, sir, I don't know what kind of uh, implementation they had, it did not have this facility. They had to be told that that facility was homegrown and is available only in IIT Bombay. So this gives a great deal of insight to the students to go fiddle with the insights of the soft software and really understand how this uh, logic simulation is taken taken. This would never happen with professional software which comes as an executable file largely protected. You can't look at it and it is so expensive that you would be shocked if you find somebody going and patching that code and so on. Whereas here the source code is available. Okay? So uh, this source code will be provided to you. We will even uh, if we have time tomorrow tell you how to recompile this. Though yesterday at least on paper I have told you all that business of 
uh, of configure, make, make install, etc., etc. We will actually do if we have some time uh, by hand, so that you know that going from a source distribution to the actual Im implementation of this software, how we go about. Okay, that done. Now let us see what is the basic technical idea behind IRSIM. And the technical idea is the following. Let us consider that you have a gate. Now this is loaded with some capacitive loading and so on. Now what was it? We have already put down our uh, parameters. We have seen what is expendable, what is not. Okay? So now let us look at the circuit in that context. Let us say that this is some logic gate. I do not care what function it performs okay? and its output stage is capacitively loaded. Now I am not in reality this in during charge time we have seen that it initially goes in constant current mode and therefore linearly and then some exponential kind of charging because it, the transistors have uh, entered the linear mode. Okay? I am not interested in this. What I want to do is to define some particular points on this trajectory and say that as long as you give me this time accurately, this is time, this is voltage. As long as you give me this time accurately, then I do not care what exact trajectory it took to go from here to here. You can pretend as if it went like this, you can pretend as if it went like this and I do not care. Right? This is what we have agreed that I do not, as long as this time is accurate, the exact trajectory in going from a 0 to 1 or a 1 to 0 is irrelevant. Okay? Now, the, uh, in doing my analysis in the first lecture, I had assumed a model for a transistor which was necessarily simple and I was worried that look actual modern devices may use a very complicated technology, their models may be very, very accurate, there are many things that we have ignored and therefore there are likely to be inaccuracies in my predictions. Okay? So now let us look at a different way of this. Okay? So let us eventually, it is going to be charged by some transistor or some transistors, this capacitor. Okay? Let us just, just for the sake of argument, let us look at a charge or a discharge alone. All right? So what is going to do, happen? Because of the intricacies of this logic, there might be some series, parallel, some such combination, it does not matter. Eventually an MOS device or a series of MOS devices are going to charge it up or charge it down. Okay? Now, let us find out what the charge time is. If you do not make any approximations or assumptions about the model of the transistor. Okay? So, let us look at the charge case because we have already started discussing the charge case. The discharge case is quite similar. Okay? So, eventually you have some device like this. And this device is connected in some complicated series, parallel, whatever. I do not care. And this guy turns on and is charging my capacitor. That is all that I need to know right now. Okay? And I want to know what is the time that it takes to charge from a given and known voltage V1 to a given and known voltage V2. This could be say 10% of VDD to 90% of VDD, whatever. That is my convention. But these voltages are known. They are standard. Okay? So, so now let us try to see how to write it down without making any approximation at all. Okay? So therefore, let us say that the current of this transistor is a function of the output voltage. It is also a function of VDD and VGG. But if I know the logic state, the VGG inside is predictable. Right? The gate voltage is predictable. That is how it is off or on. Right? So, that voltage is also some digital voltage, some fixed voltage which is not changing with time. Okay? You have applied some digital voltage there and as a result of that, the output is now changed.
changing. Okay, so let us say that the current through this transistor I is given by some function of various technological or various other parameters which remain constant, but as a function the instantaneous current okay at any given time p the current will change with time so at a given time p there is a particular value v and this v uniquely determines the current okay so let's take a let's take a step back and see the validity of this assertion okay this is my v output which is a function of time what I am saying is that at any given time t, the current which is provide, being provided by this is dependent only on V0. Okay, why is that so? Look, the gate voltage is already established. That is why this is charging. So, gate voltage, whatever it is, is some constant. And the current is determined by what? By the gate voltage, by the geometry and the drain voltage. The gate voltage is not changing the drain voltage is not changing, the power supply is not changing, the only thing which is changing is the output voltage. Therefore, the instantaneous current through this transistor is some function of V0. It is not directly a function of time, it is a function of time because it is a function of V0. Right? The, for the current through a transistor does not change with time if the voltages are held fixed. If the voltages are changed only then the current changes. Right? So, that is my assertion that it is some function of the output voltage. Once I have assumed that, the rest follows. What is the rate of charging of this? This current is then equal to C dV0 by dt. Right? This is the charge equation of this. That this current will cause a rate of change which will be related by this equation. Right? So, Alright. In that case, I can say that dt divided by c is equal to dv0 divided by some function of v0. Okay? Notice that this function could be some hypergeometric series, relation, exponential, log, not the simple equation and I do not care. As long as it is a fixed function, I do not care. It is some function. Okay? It may be divided into three ranges, four ranges, linear, saturated, I do not care. As long as the V0 is given, the I is known. That is all that I have to assume. Right? Now, if I integrate it from 0 to charge time tau, right? I have separated the variables. On the left, there is no voltage dependence. On the right, there is no time dependence. Right? So, I can integrate these two independently over their respective ranges. Then, 0 to T dt divided by C. That gives integral from V low to V high. These are known voltages. Okay? dV0 upon this function of V0. Right? Now, I am not going to perform this integral. What I am going to say is that look at this integral. It is a definite integral. Therefore, when evaluated, it may come out some complicated function, but does not matter. Eventually, for V, I am going to put V0. Right? So, it will come out a new function of V0. Right? Of V, in fact, new function of VH and VL. I will integrate it, I will get some new function of V0, and I will put the limits in it. It is a definite integral. So, wherever V0 occurs, I will put some VH and minus that function with VL. Therefore, this whole thing will be a function of now VH, VL and constants. But VH and VL themselves are constants. So, this whole thing is a known constant. If the function is not known, but this whole thing will come out to be a constant which can be determined. Right? Let us call that R. It looks like R. It is not actually R. It is very nonlinear, very complicated. It does not matter. It is some value. I just happen to put R for that value. Then I get a very simple relationship. 
What do I get? This will get tau by C equal to this R, where R is that integral evaluated with values put, and that simply gives me tau is RC. I know C. R I do not know. But R is in theory determinable. Okay? So now this is what I can do. Take a simple inverter, just one single inverter, and bring your circuit simulator with the most complicated model in the world, the most complete model in the world. Okay? And use that inverter to charge a capacitor. Okay, you are now doing detailed circuit simulation. So you will get all those complicated wiggles and straight lines and linears or whatever, it doesn't matter. Now measure the time that it takes to go from 0 to 1. Right? That is your tau. Now you know tau, you know C, then you know R. Now just store it as a variable. Okay? No more circuit simulation. From now onwards, you can just put this constant value of R in a different simulator and every time for the delay, you just put this RC. Okay? Remember, the value of this R might be different for charge, for discharge. After all, the charge is through the P channel, discharge is through N channel. These are different transistors. They may have different geometries. doesn't matter. Okay? So you take some standard geometry, use the same standard geometry. Okay? Now it turns out that the scaling laws of this time are also well known. For example, you know that the current is directly scaled by W by L. Therefore, where is that current? Here. Right? So therefore, this is, this tau by C is this value and then you can just scale that R by W by L. Right? That is in the denominator. So the wider the transistor, lower is the value of R and it will scale linearly. Right? So that this tau will scale linearly with geometry and will scale linearly with C because the only dependence of C is here. Right? But as soon as you have done one experiment with a circuit simulator, you have found all the parameters which are of interest for the charge time. Similarly, you do for discharge time. Okay? Once you have these parameters, then you can set up a simple parameter file which will contain these equivalent resistor values. Right? And now, just describe your circuit as if it was a circuit simulator and do logic simulation. What it will do is, if the input changes from 0 to 1, it will schedule an event at the output, calculate the CR time and will schedule an event at the output that much time later. Right? Then you finish all the events at the current time, advance the time variable to that later time and make the output equal to that value at that time and then see who is affected by that value. Right? And then re-simulate those, calculate their CR values and schedule events at their output and so on till you have propagated the uh, thing to all over the circuit. Okay? So, have you followed? The major insight is that if you are not interested in the shape only in the value of the time, then essentially what you are saying is that I am able to cheat and assume that this F is a very simple function which is easy to integrate. Okay? And since the whole thing is a definite integral, it comes out a constant. As long as I, I can calculate the integral, it doesn't matter the detailed shape, what the detailed shape is. The integral in some sense is integration of current is charge. It tells you how much, how, how long it takes you to put that much charge on this capacitor. Okay? You may put a lot of charge first and very little charge later or very little charge first and a lot of charge later. Who cares? This is only the integral value that you are interested in. That is a constant. Okay? So you may have two inverters with different kinds of transistors. As long as their R value is the same, their delay is the same and for digital simulation they are equivalent. For analog guys will make a lot of uh, difference between them saying oh no, no, no this is in constant current charging, this is resistive charging or whatever. We don't care. Okay? On the other hand, it does take those things into account which are of importance. For example, tomorrow you decide that the low value is something else, the high value is something else, this time will change. Okay? And then you will have to recalculate data. But once calculated, you can set up a new parameter file. As soon as you have a new technology, new uh, voltage differences and so on, that means this thing depends 
on technology it depends on uh, the supply voltage and it depends on your definition of what is the low voltage and what is the high voltage once that is given then for those values you do a detailed circuit simulation evaluate the value of r and then now for as long as these things don't change this r will remain the same okay this is what is done by irc first is a parameter file okay this must be created and for most technologies these parameters are downloadable okay so for some technology the somebody has done that painful calc not very painful actually very simple calculation just 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 do an inverter right just integrate just just do an inverter but it also provides you by the way a methodology so that you can do it on your own if you have a new technology okay so these parameter files are available or you can create your own doesn't matter okay the format and so on of this so but parameter file is one important con before that you cannot proceed then you need a file which describes your circuit right so you p mos is connected like this n mos is connected like this etc etc okay remember you are not thinking of it as logic gates you are thinking of it as a detailed circuit so every transistor is being described okay so p mos is driven by this etc etc you give it what is the geometry of this transistor you must give because its corresponding r value and the capacitive load that it puts on others that will be scaled according to its geometry okay so you must give the geometry so that the appropriate loads and appropriate on resistance etc can be calculated all of that comes from this circuit description combined with these parameters okay and finally there is a command file in some sense this is a remnant of the history of irsim in the sense that earlier it only had a command file it would not work interactively okay the original sim program so you specify what inputs are provided at what time does the input change from 0 to 1 etc etc so you must have a language for describing the input okay and that is put in the file but in addition to that now it has become interactive there are other things that you put now you have a circuit you have a huge number of nodes you don't care for all of those nodes right in fact if it told you the waveform at each one of those nodes that would be confusing and you will not be able to draw the proper con conclusions so you there are only a few signals which are of interest to you and whose waveforms you want to see so you should be able to specify of course every node will be simulated but you want you want to be able to specify whose waveform will actually be reported on the screen okay so that is input output control you specify what signals are there at what time does the signal go high at what time does the signal go low etc etc okay all such stuff goes into the command file the command file is optional the command file could have been null zero in that case all these things will be described interactively okay however the command file is a great help what happens is that let's say that there is this complicated circuit and you are working it up to a large part and then something interesting happens now every time you run the simulation you don't want to say all right clear this flip flop put this signal high then put this signal low and long story before you come to the interesting part right so what you would like is that all that history can be put in this command file and you run the command file and then the program should wait for you to give interactive inputs and then you can interactively make the time go forward or backward as you wish okay in addition to that there are debugging tools for example you specify a node and it will tell you which node is driven by it and which node drives it okay so if you are tracing the circuit backwards or forwards something is going bad at some node you want to know who is trying to pull it up who is trying to pull it down such questions can be asked and the program will provide you those answers okay now i believe that this is not the right place for doing it because you should have the program in front of you and then it is so much easier if i just start describing it here it won't be that much interesting so we will hold that back for the lab session itself but in this session what is important is that even to make a beginning you have to understand how the program is going to be used okay so the program is installed as we had discussed yesterday it is installed in user local bin user local bin is in your path so when you invoke it 
okay you must invoke it with these three files okay and just to make sure see what happens is that these parameter files are going to be used left right and center and these are probably not generated by you so you are not familiar with this parameter file what happens if by mistake you produce an output which use the wrong parameter file okay so you might have simulated this effectively in point 1 micron technology whereas you have a 1 micron technology so you are very happy with the results but actually these results are not valid right so to take care of that this program puts down a tag which must be linked with the parameter file so for example the parameter file may put down the lambda for a 1.6 micron technology for example it will say lambda equal to 0.8 so in your sim file you must put down lambda 0.8 okay that does a sanity check that this sim file was written for this technology and indeed the parameter file which is being used is that same technology okay so that one part is important the other thing is that just like any specification language it allows for comments it allows for various pause points and so on and those we will learn as we go along okay so this is the description of the program that we are doing now for our lab strategy for most of these uh, programs i have a three tier strategy for doing it this is what i follow with students and i recommend that you follow with your students and the reason for that is the following suppose you have this big and complicated program which does things now most of the modern generation students are probably not afraid but if there is a new program i know i shouldn't be afraid but if it is a new and unfamiliar program i am a little inhibited at first okay because there are too many unknowns therefore as step 1 i provide tutorials what do these tutorials do everything is pre cooked for you you don't have to do anything you know that the program runs with this input file right because later we very often these specific you know specification languages you put a semicolon instead of comma etc etc and they come back and swipe you across the face right so the point is that first let's take a familiar situation and give you a tutorial we have done our work on it we know that this works if it doesn't work then you are doing something wrong in running the program once you are comfortable running the program with something known where you expect the output to do something it actually does those things then you become a little adventurous then you say let us see if i do this what will happen etc etc okay so the first step in this whole process is this playing around with something that somebody else has given you okay so i have one example for you this example is an adder okay but using cpl okay we have done this in the class yesterday so it is a good uh, excuse now to become familiar with it you could have done it with the standard cmos it will work with that as well but it is interesting to see how cpl works it's a unusual kind of logic so the given tutorial file is a cpl file okay notice that cpl while it has lots of very good properties it has one very bad property and that is that if the signal and signal bar are not matched they don't arrive at the same time then either both switches will turn on or the two switches that we saw yesterday or neither will turn on this can lead to glitches okay so it produces lots of glitches that's why it is not as widely used as the standard cmos unless bit and bit bar are time matched okay as professor uh, chandrakar had described okay so one interesting side experiment of this is that right now on purpose i am generating the bit and bit bar in the worst possible way that means i am taking the signal and for signal bar i put an inverter right in other words it is zero one fork using professor chandrakar's technology yesterday right and that you know will be very bad because it in theory can never be matched right you need an infinitely fast inverter for the two delays to be matched but that is what i have used to show the functionality you play around with it okay so i have as i told you i have a three step uh, strategy for most of these uh, 
experiments. So the first step is tutorial. In which case, what you are learning is how this program operates. Okay? The input is known to you, input is given to you, the output is known to you. Okay? You are just confirming that it does what you expect it, it should do. Right? The next step is an incremental step in which a small assignment is given to you. The small assignment in this case is that you take out the inverter and for all inputs add a 2, 3 fork and adjust the geometries till the inverting and non-inverting inputs arrive exactly at the same point. Okay? So you are not changing this a whole lot. You are just taking out all inverters and changing the inverters by a 2 inverter chain and a 3 inverter chain whose delays are adjusted to be identical. Right? 2 slow inverters and 3 fast inverters. Right? So that their total delay is the same. Correct? Now your bit and bit bar will arrive roughly as well as you can manage at the same time. Correct? Now run the same circuit again and see whether many glitches vanish or not. That way you know which glitches were the results of this time mismatch. Okay? Now the actual result of this is not very important. The adder is not an earth shaking circuit. But the point is that you will become confident enough that you can now make changes to this uh, file and run a circuit which is at least partially of your own construction. The third step in the lab then is that you create something totally on your own. Okay? So a simple enough function is given to you and you are asked that you design this circuit and see that it works properly. Okay? And that assignment is something which is unrelated so that you will not be tempted to just redo what has been done. The idea is that you just design, very simple circuit, just design a divide by 2 circuit using a D flip flop, putting Q bar back to D. Right? So it will become a toggle flip flop. You just give it a clock, the output should be divided by 2. Currently, that's all that we can do in one lab. Right? But the potential is obvious. Then later you can make a synchronous, a synchronous counter, a asynchronous counter, a decoder, even an ALU unit or what, you, what have you. Right? Now the way this adder is made is that it first makes AND, OR, XOR, all kinds of logic. So it is first a tutorial in uh, complementary pass gate logic and then it just makes use of OR and XOR etc. to make sum and carry. Okay? So it's a, it's essentially a full adder of a 4 bit quantity. Right? So that is what you are going to do first as a tutorial, then modify the bit bit bar generation using forks and re redo it and finally create a file of your own and uh, generate it using uh, uh, your own editor and creating a divide by 2 circuit. That is what is the goal of the lab today.